Thank you so much. And uh, uh, Dr. Abhay is not attending the conference, so basically I'm going to be combining two talks. I hope to give you a very comprehensive coverage on astigmatic uh, control in cataract surgery in the next few minutes. All of us know that almost in the anterior corneal curvature is what matters. Nearly 20% of our patients have more than 1.5 diopters of cylinder, about 10% have more than 2 diopters of cylinder, and rarely even 3 diopters of cylinder can be there. And because for the patients to have good quality and quantity of vision is extremely important that we address this cylinder during our cataract surgery. So the, even a 0.5 millimeter of uncorrected uh, cylinder, when the pupils is about 4.5 millimeters, which is often the ambient pupil, can cause this amount of deterioration in the quality of vision. And that's the reason that you need to address this quite uh, adequately. And what are the options available to us? Obviously, the mainstay is toric and troc lenses. You also have laser arcuate keratotomy, limbal relaxing incisions, opposite clear corneal incisions. I'll just briefly go through these things. Uh, for a long time, I used to think that my uh, 2.4 millimeter clear corneal incision causes a 0.44 diopters of astigmatism. I used to position the incision depending upon the axis of the astigmatism on the steep axis. And today, it's well proven that the surgically induced astigmatism, when you look at the centroid value, because the astigmatism not only has a magnitude, but also has a direction which tend to cancel out each other, is more in the range of about just point one diopter. We'll be alluding to this again later, but suffice it to say, no longer the concept of positioning the astigmatism on the steep axis is valid because it seems to have hardly any effect. The only place where I use it occasionally is that when I'm doing a fake intraocular lens, patient, those younger patients have a with the rule astigmatism. I create a three millimeter incision and a superior incision has a greater impact on astigmatic neutralization than a temporal incision. In those cases for a 0.5 diopters or so, I might use it. But as far as cataract surgery is concerned, it's always temporal clear corneal astigmat uh, incision and dealing with the astigmatism by other means. And this opposite clear corneal incision is a very old video of mine. At the end of surgery, all you do is to pass in a 2.4 millimeter diamond knife or whatever knife you're using in the nasally, and uh, you expect this to act. There are some papers which say that it neutralizes up to about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 diopters. Especially no instrument is passing through this incision. There's no in distortion. This wound almost completely heals up. And again, I think, believe that this is more for the surgeon's comfort level, believing that he is doing something for the patient rather than any true impact as far as serious astigmatism is concerned. So this is again something that I hardly practice in my um, uh, situation. One of the limbal relaxing incisions is something which is very relevant, and this is the way it's done. But the problem with that is that it is something like radial keratotomy. You do not know how much is going to function, on whom it is going to function, and whatever impact you get initially, how long it's going to last as far as the patient is concerned. So basically, in case you have a patient who is going in a multifocal intraocular lens with a 0 0.5, 0 0.75 diopters of astigmatism, with a guarded diamond knife of about 600 microns, you can go ahead and do a limbal relaxing incision. But this is again, the amount of impact depends upon the corneal hysteresis of that patient, not just the size of the incision that you are creating. And that's the reason you cannot be very sure about the impact of these incisions again. I had given up doing limbal relaxing incisions almost for a decade, but once I had got hold of a digital imaging system, for the last 10 years or so, once again, I started doing limbal relaxing incisions for the simple reason that here, this is more accuracy. The exact arc length of the incision that you need to create, the position of the incision is uh, better determined. But still, this is uh, um, for small amounts of astigmatism where you can do a good cataract surgery and the end of it doing a limbal relaxing incision. This is just the scars of a first day post-operative limbal relaxing incision that has been done. Once the laser platform became available to us, the laser arcuates has definitely a role to play. And that's the, these two incisions are what you're seeing after the nucleus emulsification after the rexis. These are the incisions which are created. Even if it's against the rule of astigmatism, I'm doing a clear corneal temporal incision. I go ahead and uh, uh, place these incisions because they are placed at eight millimeters. My incision is, uh, is uh, mm, uh, 
enters the cornea before that. And as you can see that you have to always open up these incisions. There was a talk about intrastomal incisions because it causes less amount of irritation. But unless you open up these incisions, they are not in, in, uh, effective. Here again, as you can see, I put in a multifocal intraocular lens. This patient had about 0.6 diopters of astigmatism. A toric intraocular lens was not indicated. So I go ahead and use the laser arcuate keratotomy. Maybe this is slightly better than doing uh, the uh, earlier uh, liberal relaxing incision because these incisions are image guided. They're more precise and uniform. The depth of these incisions can be precisely controlled to 80% or 90%. There's good visualization of these incisions. And uh, uh, it's also claimed that these are titratable in the sense that you do not open them on the first post-operative day. Wait for about a week's time. And depending upon the residual astigmatism, you can open up this. I have really not done this even once. And you can see this uh, pad laser arcuate keratotomies that have been done. Suffice it to say, here again, you can use it for cases that, where there is small amounts of astigmatism, you, you, where the toric intraoc lens is really not indicated, and you can uh, use these incisions to titrate the residual astigmatism that the patient has to deal with in the post-operative period. As to my mind, the uh, may, mainstay for treatment of astigmatism in cataract surgery is the toric intraoc lenses. Let's dwell upon this a little more. Ideally, a toric intraocular lens is to be placed where the astigmatism is orthogonal, that is where the steep and the flat axis, even if they are oblique, are exactly at 90 degrees to each other. Whenever the astigmatism is irregular, like in corneal scar, post radial keratotomy, in a case of keratoconus, these are relatively contraindicated. But having said that, there are quite a few cases of keratoconus where we do a topo-guided PRK or uh, um, corneal intacts. They center these rings and then the residual astigmatism, we go ahead and use, if it's a cataract surgery, using a toric intraocular lenses or um, a, a toric uh, ICL in case it's a younger patient. Here again, it's not refractive accuracy, you promise. But most importantly, for the purpose of today's discussion, uh, the, it's orthogonal astigmatism where the steep and flat axis is uh, are at 90 degrees to each other. It's a regular astigmatism where this functions uh, the best. One of the most uh, basic tenets, I think all of you know, is that refractive astigmatism rarely has a role to play because what we are dealing with in the post-operative period is, a, uh, is the con anterior corneal astigmatism. You can see you do not really need an eye trace to go ahead and implant these uh, toric intraoc lenses, but just to drive home the point, this is from the cornea, this is the internal from the lens of astigmatism. And as you can see in this particular case, almost the entire corneal astigmatism that the patient was having in his glasses about 1.5 diopters is from the lens. The cornea itself is quite pristine with no astigmatism. And obviously this patient, even though was wearing uh, um, astigmatic glasses right through his life, is not a candidate for a toric intraocular lens. On the other hand, you can have a situation like this where the corneal and the internal uh, astigmatism tend to almost neutralize each other and the patient has not been wearing any toric intraocular lens. But then uh, he, because once the intraocular lens is taken away, this corneal astigmatism is going to become manifest. So this would be a candidate for a toric intraocular lens. So just uh, you definitely should have a look at the astigmatism in this patient's spectacles, but you should not be guided by that. It's essentially the corneal topography or the measurement with the um, of the corneal astigmatism which should guide you. I would say that the last six or seven years, our results with uh, toric intraocular lenses have improved dramatically. And uh, that's not just because of better lenses have become available, because our concepts about these three basic uh, features have significantly improved. Let me dwell upon this uh, for a uh, little briefly. Posterior cornea was always an enigma. Our machines don't measure it. We do not understand it till Doc Cog, Graham Barrett, etc. came out with their papers, similar uh, suggestions that uh, the posterior cornea has a significant role to play. It is most often steeper vertically of a, with a mean power of about 0.3 diopters. So whenever you have uh, anterior against the rule astigmatism, this is potentiated by the posterior corneal astigmatism. But if you have a with the rule astigmatism, which is quite rare in the cataract age group, the 
posterior corneal astigmatism tends to reduce this. So this is a, the, hence the importance of taking into consideration the posterior corneal astigmatism apart from just the anterior corneal astigmatism. And when you take both these into the consideration, that's when the concept of total corneal astigmatism comes in. Another very important aspect that you need to understand is that the astigmatism on the anterior cornea of the patient is not just stable right through the lifetime of the patient. The posterior corneal astigmatism does not change, but the anterior corneal astigmatism changes by about three-eighths of a diopter for every decade of the lifetime of the patient. That is exactly the reason why most of our uh, uh, laser refractive correction patients who are of the younger age group have uh, with the rule astigmatism, while most of our cataract age group patients have against the rule astigmatism. And this is again something that we need to uh, remember. The implication of this is that when you have a younger patient with, uh, uh, with the rule astigmatism, Undercorrected. So, in a pediatric cataract, if you are thinking of cataract, uh, doing a um, uh, toric intraocular lens, if we say one 1.5 diopters are with the rule astigmatism, also, they, you would not consider a toric intraocular lens simply because this is going to go away on its own during the lifetime of the patient. The other important aspect that we need to understand is that it has been classically explained you need 1.5 diopters of astigmatism in the intraocular lens plane to correct about one diopter at the corneal plane. But just like the ELP is important as far as our spherical correction is concerned, it is also the correction of the astigmatism is also dependent upon the length of the eyeball, the overall basic power of the intraocular lens that you're implanting. In a highly hypropic short eye, the, you just required 1.2 diopters in the intraocular lens to correct one diopter. Well, in a highly myopic eye, you might require as much as 1.75 diopters. This chart nicely brings this out where you see that a short eye with a flat cornea just requires about 1.29 diopters, while a long eye with a steep cornea requires almost 1.86 diopters. So this is a toricity ratio where you can you have to understand Mind you, you need not really break your head about this because most of these things are incorporated in the calculator itself, as you will see. But it is important that you understand these concepts. So whether it's a basic lens, a spherical lens is a plus 5 diopter as a plus 30 diopter, the amount of cylindrical correction that is needed in these lenses are going to be very... We always already alluded to this and we all, uh, we, today we know that the surgically induced astigmatism has both a magnitude and a direction. And if you look at a plot like this, then they tend to neutralize over the surface and average centroid value of a, say, at 2.4 millimeter or a sub 2.4 millimeter is just about 0.1 diopter. Or you can just completely ignore this and irrespective of where exactly of the steepness of the cornea, we go ahead and do a temporal clear corneal in these situations. We already alluded to the choice of formula and the Barrett uh, suite of formula is what we use in our practice. It is not the Barrett universal two formula, which is our uh, go-to formula, but is a Barrett toric calculator, which we uh, use for most of our patients. And this is available in many of our optical biometers, also in the ACRS, APACRS websites. Oops, I'm sorry about that. Uh, this is the drop-down menu you can see in the ACRS, APACRS websites. So even if you're using a, a immersion A-scan and a manual keratometer, you can use this uh, formula and get the benefits out of this. Only thing is, instead of using an optical A constant, you have to use an acoustic A constant in case the particular lens that you're using has the two, two different constants. All the earlier points that I alluded to are incorporated in this. As you can see, we have an axial length, we have an anterior chamber depth, the basic intraocular lens, spherical power is also taken into consideration because of the concept of toricity ratio. Whether it was a plus 20 diopter or whether it's a 10 diopter lens, the amount of toricity that's required is going to change. Uh, you can see the surgically induced astigmatism has been fed in as 0.1. 
and then the k value the k uh, the k index can also change depending upon the particular instrument that you are using and most often it's 1.3375 but it also can be 1.33 with certain 333 and that again uh, putting in the correct value uh, enhances the quality of outcomes as far as these calculations are concerned the reason we go for a Barrett torque calculator as our primary source for uh, calculation, not just for our toric intraocular lenses, but all intraocular lenses, is that it automatically incorporates po posterior corneal astigmatism, even if you are not measuring it directly. It takes into consideration the drift in the astigmatism that uh, takes place during the life of the patient. Targets about 0.25 to 0.5 diopters are with the rule astigmatism takes into consideration the axial length and the intraocular lens spherical power, that is the toricity ratio. The centroid value of the induced astigmatism, that's a variable value of 0 0.1, is something that you can feed into the uh, your calculation. And the K-index is, again, that can be uh, taken into consideration. Now coming to the marking, the very fact that so many different uh, uh, ways of marking is uh, uh, available to us essentially shows up that uh, none of them are absolutely accurate. But whatever you are comfortable with, you must stick to standardize it and go ahead and use it. To my mind, if you do not have a digital marking system, marking on the slit lamp with the pupils not dilated, making it a horizontal slit, and using a 26 gauge needle to create a small uh, subquintal hemorrhage on either side tells you where exactly the 0, 180 degrees axis is there. But if you, of course, have a digital overlay system, that would be the way to go. Let's very quickly look at a couple of uh, videos and uh, where essentially it's a toric implant. This is, I'm not using a digital overlay system and that's the Mendel's ring where the orientation of the intraocular lens is essentially shown. And uh, I may, as you can see, I'm making a 2.4 millimeter. Uh, here it's a 2.2 millimeter, it's a fairly old video. But now I shifted over to a 2.4 millimeter incision and the toric intraocular lens is going un, uh, under viscoelastic. And it's extremely important that at the end of the surgery, this viscoelastic is completely evacuated. You usually rotate the lens and position it in such a way that you need about 5 to 10 degrees of rotation for final orientation of these lenses. This is essentially the marks along which the lens has to be oriented. As you can see, I'm going even behind the intraocular lens and evacuating the viscoelastic quite completely. Then I'm going to be positioning the lens. Tapping the lens onto the posterior uh, capsule is also important. Uh, mind you, most of the rotation of these toric and torque lenses occur in the first one hour. That's one of the reasons I patch all my toric and torque lenses, even though I do most of my surgeries under topical anesthesia for a period of a couple of hours be before I see them post-operatively and discharge them and I take off the patch. When, when you have a digital overlay, either a Callisto or a Varion like this, then the preoperative marking is not necessary. And uh, uh, it's not just the uh, toric marking six alone, the capsule, the exact position of the incisions, of course, uh, it's, uh, as I said, it's now at uh, 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 te temporal 180 degrees. And uh, you uh, can, uh, my uh, side port incisions are about 50 to 60 degrees apart. and. Uh, you are going to be making a main incision of about 2.4 millimeters and subsequently doing a capsular excess. And then we go on to, uh, that's uh, at the end of the FACO emulsification. I don't routinely polish my, my rim of the anterior capsule. That's the intraocular lens that is being injected. And that now the digital overlay will come on, which automatically takes into consideration the cyclotorsion that's inherent in this particular eye and uh, um, also the pupil centroid shift so that you can exactly position the intraocular lens where it's needed. In, uh, removal of the uh, viscoelastic quite completely before uh, in, uh, closing up the surgery is extremely important. Today, I've got almost completely shifted over to a hydro implantation where you can see there is no viscoelastic that's going in. You would not see the digital overlay here because of some camera compatibility issues, but the very on overlay is there. And this is, uh, you can see the uh, uh, irrigation cannula in place. 
or which stabilizes the eyeball also. And uh, after the injecting the intraocular lens inside, I just position the uh, toric lens based upon my varian overlay. And uh, the necessity to remove the viscoelastic quite completely is uh, uh, done away with, which saves about a couple of minutes as far as the surgery is concerned. Oh, yes, the tori uh, you can see the varian overlay over here, and you can see the very accurate orientation. I think not just for the spherical intraocular lenses, even for toric intraocular lenses, your multifocals, you can consider hydro implant it seems to be a good way to go. We already talked about this digital overlay and uh, importance of correcting astigmatism with tri and whenever you're using a multifocal. I did put a trifocal implant. The patient were very happy as far as near vision was concerned. You see that for the distant vision, the patient has a significant uh, residual mixed astigmatism and the uncorrected vision was just about 618 patient was not uh, happy at all with the outcome. So essentially we were to do a laser touch-up, but the patient was understanding. So for the same patient, we had just about 0.86 dioptus in the other eye. You can see when I use the Alcon toric calculator, it shows up a T3 multifocal that's necessary and a T3 panoptics lens was that was implanted and it immediately shows that once the astigmatism is taken care of, you get a 6-6 and 6 vision with a more happy patient. We had to deal with the residual astigmatism the first eye which had a monofocal, which uh, had a uh, non-toric multifocal intraocular lens with a laser vision correction three months down the line. Again, as was mentioned, uh, whether it's against the rule astigmatism or with the rule astigmatism is extremely important. I am often asked, what exactly is the cylinder value beyond which you consider a toric intraocular lens? It is not just the magnitude of the astigmatism alone which is important, but the axis is also extremely important. You have a 0.98 diopters of against the rule astigmatism, and what the calculator shows up is a need for a T4 intraocular lens. But on the other hand, if you have uh, almost a with the rule astigmatism, um, 0.75 diopters of astigmatism, what it shows up is an, uh, a non toric intraocular lens is what is needed. That's the reason that we essentially use uh, toric Barrett toric calculator as your go to formula, even before the Barrett Universal 2, because when you're using the Barrett Universal 2, we go ahead and recommend these patients, talk to them about a monofocal intraocular lens, then find out that the patient actually needs a toric lens and we have to start talking to them about a toric multifocal or a toric monofocal. So even before counseling, we go ahead and use this. So my final tips to maximize outcomes with these uh, uh, toric intraocular lenses are Multiple measurements of K readings is extremely important. Of course, if you have access to optical biometer, that would be the way to go. Just in case you have to choose between upgrading your mid-level FACO instrumentation to a higher-end FACO instrumentation or getting an optical biometer, I'd always say uh, going ahead and investing in an optical biometer would be the right way to go. But at the same time, you, it's not that you need an optical biometer to go ahead and start using toric intraocular lenses or multifocal intraocular lenses. We have several centers where we do not have access to an optical biometer, but still we go ahead and use the, uh, do implant torics and multifocals. Consider, but be not guided by refractive cylinder. Check the ocular surface. Dr. Titial just gave a wonderful talk about the importance of optimizing the ocular surface, not just for before the surgery, but even before your measurements. SIA is 0.1 for a temporal to 2.4 millimeter incision. Undercorrect with the rule, overcorrect against the rule. And as far as the surgical steps are concerned, make a little longer incision because you want a very stable chamber. Avoid over-inflating these Ablation lenses because if you have even fluid behind the intraocular lens, there's a greater tendency to rotate. Use a, do a hydro implantation or do a complete visco removal and nudge the intraocular lens onto the PC at the end of the surgery so that it rests there. Slightly smaller rexes. Ensure position once the speculum is off. And I still give you, these are the formula that you could use if there is a residual toricity. It's basically waiting for uh, Maipal to join him. <laughs> and I think our time is exactly thank, thank you, Dr. Ramamurthy, for a wonderful master class on uh, toric uh, IOL implantation. Beautifully covered. Just one question before Dr. Maipal sets in the presentation. We do have a lot of patients with pterygium who have, you know, a lot of significant corneal astigmatism also. So how do we tackle the patient with pterygium and cataracts? Sir? 
Yeah, so if it is a small pterygium, which is just uh, nasally there, and uh, the astigmatism, say, assuming that the other eye doesn't have a, uh, a pterygium, if the astigmatism in the both eyes is nearly the same, I just ignore the pterygium and then just go ahead with the conventional surgery. But if it is a large pterygium, and uh, usually it's the flattening along the uh, axis, that's uh, in the steep axis, that take the 0, 180 degrees that takes place, and it is different from what is there in the other eye, I go ahead and do the pterygium excision, wait for a period of two to three weeks for the cornea to stabilize, remeasure the corneal astigmatism, and then decide whether the patient needs a toric and lens or a non-toric lens.